In its own way, radio has made more of an impact and more quickly on Africa than on any other continent, and particularly on Africa south of the Sahara. It has brought to the remotest villages where other media scarcely scratch the surface, communication, information, education, and a release from the isolation that for centuries made Africa the dark continent. Tonight, Angus McDermott, who has spent much of the past 13 years as a BBC correspondent in the developing countries of Africa, looks at the impact radio has made on their people and illustrates the kind of programmes that are broadcast. Angus McDermott. One by one, like birds greeting the dawn, the radio stations of Africa come on the air. A continent wakes up to the morning news. This is the International Service of the Hungarian Broadcasting Corporation. It's now 0715 Greenwich Mean Time. Here is the news brought by Chris that was the Nigerian radio as heard in South Africa, 3,000 miles away, and as vivid an illustration as any of the way in which African radio has developed. For not until after the Second World War did the colonial authorities get around to thinking seriously about broadcasting. Seen first as a desirable adjunct to education and the spreading of information, it grew steadily in stature. Simpler, cheaper and more robust receivers were devised, and before long every colony had its own radio service. Some of them, like Nigeria, patterned on that of the colonial power, and in that case also helped through teething stages by the BBC. And with independence, the national radio organisations blossomed and flourished. An early form of radio entertainment in Nigeria was the serial. Save Journey, as one was called, became as popular there as Mrs. Dale's Diary or The Archers in Britain. The title is taken from the name of a bus, one of those overloaded, underpowered, flamboyantly driven vehicles as typically West African as a palm tree. The chief characters were Alao, the resourceful master driver, his faithful assistant, Shaky Shaky, and the profit-conscious employer, who in this episode has been persuaded by a slick salesman that white uniforms will attract more passengers. He explains the plan to his dubious staff. <laughs> the experiment is that you will wear white uniform like a gentleman to be driving the lorry. Okay. You mean I go wear this white inside the lorry safe, Johnny? That is what I talk. Hey, but, Oga, okay, all day everywhere, and I'm not going to feed John for a telly boy. I am not here to make you argue. I have tell telling you that I can do, I am doing experiment to see how my business is making of improve. Go and do likewise. Alas, the business doesn't make improve at all. Allow and shaky return at the end of the day without money looking as they mournfully relate like crosses between houseboys and district commissioners they'd become the laughing stock of the passengers who'd gone elsewhere the boss changes his mind rapidly take off those uniforms he says and go and get some business Allahu and Sheki. Yes, sir, sir. gentleman or no gentleman white or no white go and bring the passenger bring the money throw for ground count and make all man see that's all right <laughs> Count them, make all see, in that lilting West African idiom the arguments are developed, logic and good sense prevail, and there's a little chorus which clinches it, with the common man emerging triumphant. There's something of this typical Nigerian form in the commercial that I'll play now, the discussion and the final chorus of consensus about the beer which makes you strong and sociable. If you drink golden guinea every day, it will make you strong and sociable. Golden guinea, golden guinea, it will make you happy and popular. Na true, bo. golden guinea will give you new life every day. Golden guinea, now everybody beer. And people when they drink and they talk, say golden guinea, they make them strong and sociable. So therefore, golden guinea, now why you? Now why oh, isn't that so? Again, the clincher to the argument. But what of Nigerian music? Well, the most popular form is the high life, with its throaty, wailing sound. But one of my favourites was the variant of the narrative Calypso, which informs and entertains. Here's a group of students from the University of Ibadan, describing proudly how their alma mater became autonomous. Twas a day we remember, the 18th of November, the year 1963, when Sabo Baka became Chancellor. No more special relation with the London Varsity, University of Ibadan, awarded his first honorary degrees.
Hard work and scholarship pay. It was in about 1959 that the transistor revolution got underway in Nigeria. The enterprising Japanese had flooded the country with pocket-sized receivers which sold for about six pounds each. They were all the rage in the towns and so were the bigger shortwave models for the rural areas. In Africa as a whole, between 1950 and 1960, the number of radio receivers quadrupled and so did the total combined power of the continent's transmitters, although Africa still does lag behind other continents. But there's no doubt about the contribution broadcasting makes to culture and the arts. Here's a melodramatic slice of Ghanaian life. Hey, is everybody here deaf and dumb? But what is this, Mensa? You burst into my room before I even have time to answer your knock, and you are insulting me on top. Well, take me to court for that. I don't think my husband would tolerate such impudence from you if he were here. <laughs> you are laughing. Your husband, Kwamina. <laughs> yes, my husband. If you think Kwamina can raise the finger against me, you are flattering yourself immensely. What do you mean, you insolent man? Or you think if it comes to resorting to the law, he hasn't got the means to do so? <laughs> the means indeed. Do you know why I'm here? I have come here for my money. Apart from religious stations like ELWA, Eternal Love Wins Africa, in Liberia, and The Voice of the Gospel, in Addis Ababa, both of which enjoy well-deserved reputations for their programs, most African radio stations are government-controlled, and, of course, put the official view first, and sometimes exclusively. And they're often used for obvious political purposes, for some leaders have realized that radio can be used not only to build their nations, but to consolidate their own positions. But I have found Africans on the whole to be instinctively selective listeners, ready to turn elsewhere if they suspect that what they hear isn't entirely objective. With its vast new listening public and its increasing political consciousness, Africa is a natural target for the world's radio propagandists. Here's Radio Peace and Progress, otherwise Radio Moscow, warning the Africans against neo-colonialist and imperialist exploitation. Practice has shown that foreign investors of capital in the economic development of the Asian and African countries are, in fact, not interested in it at all. Their main goal is to make a maximum profit. Not all the communist countries put out endless propaganda. Some lace it judiciously with African music, like Prague Radio, here playing a tune which was top of the charts in the Congo for a long time. <laughs> Millions of pounds are spent in Moscow, Peking and elsewhere on shortwave radio propaganda in English and the vernaculars directed at Africa. But I must say this, whether or not most of my African friends and acquaintances have just been polite, I don't know, but I honestly cannot recall any ordinary African man in the street ever telling me, or even indirectly revealing, that he listened to communist broadcasts regularly or at all. The BBC and The Voice of America have faithful and sizable audiences, and I know equally that Moscow and Peking quote many listeners' letters from Africa. I can't readily explain this discrepancy, but I would just add with some feeling, as one who has regularly and sometimes frantically combed the shortwave ether, that you have to be a pretty dedicated listener if your attention is to be held by propaganda through all the fading and atmospherics. Localized radio propaganda is another matter. It tends to be louder, clearer, and more meaningful. Throughout the Nigerian Civil War, Radio Biafra exercised an almost hypnotic fascination over listeners in Nigeria proper. Expertly, ceaselessly, loudly, persuasively, it broadcast its version of the war in several languages. Its program content was to some a little disconcerting. I once heard myself being described as lazy, dishonest, and a bloody liar. In these days, South Africa is worried about broadcasts in Zulu and Koza from emigre non-whites in Dar es Salaam. Rhodesia, too, waits anxiously to see how Zambia uses its high-power transmitters, lately donated by the communist Chinese. And the white governments of Southern Africa have their political pep talks, too. Here's a commentary on South Africa radio, which also broadcasts on a worldwide basis in many languages. Ours was the first of all countries on the continent to challenge colonialism. 
And many years ago now, it took account of the irreversible tide towards independent black nationhood. In the matter of self-determination, it was ahead of world opinion in that it recognized self-determination as the right of each and every people to maintain its separate identity through a political and cultural system of its own. South Africa, which has a first-class local radio network for its African population, is always anxious to explain and rationalize its own point of view. The Portuguese in Africa, however, tend to make their point musically. Radio Luanda in Angola, where for 11 years thousands of Africans have been in a state of rebellion, sometimes goes on the air with this resounding and defiant chorus, Angola is ours. Everywhere the popular diet is news and music. If there's a commercial, the two can be combined, as in South Africa. Late night special, Neville Dawson reporting. And so, for 24 hours a day, the words flow from Africa's transmitters and transistors. Powerful, insistent, often contradictory. Yet, always not far away, there's the rhythmic beat of the drum and the guitar, for music is the real bread and butter of African broadcasting. And if the atmospherics and the fading sometimes muffle the political message, the steady beat of the drum surges through, and the swing of the guitar survives, to be there on tap, in the transistor, when the African listener feels the urge to dance, which is often. 